Cabernet tends to be the sort of Errol Flynn of the great varieties. One of Australia's leading beer judges. People always ask, how do you get involved in sake and how does that connect to music? Because wine is an adventure. Conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty. The prestigious title of sake samurai. Looking at whiskey in more of an artful culinary way. The difference between getting good quality fresh hops, it just translates straight through into the beer. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson. And this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. The craft beer movement that has taken hold globally over recent decades has been spearheaded by a single beer style, India Pale Ale. IPA absolutely dominates craft beer in North America, where the movement started, and it has become increasingly popular here in Australia over recent years. One of the brewers who has been in the box seat to witness and drive that evolution is Richard Watkins, founder of Bent Spoke Brewing Company in Canberra. Richard has been brewing continuously since 1994. By that I mean he is still actively involved in the day-to-day process of making the beer, rather than delegating that to someone else. By his reckoning, that potentially makes him Australia's longest-serving brewer. Ben Spoke produces a whole host of different IPAs, led by its flagship beer, Crankshaft IPA. But this interview coincides with the latest release of Cluster 8, Ben Spoke's big, bold, double IPA that is part of its Drifter series of beers that drift in and out of availability each year. A quick note before we get underway, as regular listeners would well know, Bintani, the brewing and distilling ingredients supplier, is a major sponsor of the Drinks Adventures podcast. Bintani is also a shareholder in Ben Spoke Brewing Company, so I just want to disclose that conflict of interest so you don't find out later and think there was anything cynical about this episode, which really isn't the case. Ben Spoke is one of Australia's largest independent craft breweries, and Richard Watkins was bound to come up as a guest one way or another. And as someone who has been brewing for as long as he has, I thought Richard was about the best person to answer some questions about the evolution of IPA in Australia, how it's brewed, the different styles of IPA in Ben Spoke's range, the continued splintering of this style into many subgenres, and whether it is always best to drink IPAs as fresh as possible, as we're always told by brewers. Our conversation started with Richard recalling his earliest memories of IPAs in Australia. And that's coming up in just a moment. What I love about Australian craft spirits is that our distillers are truly free to experiment. We aren't governed by rules and traditions. That's why the flavour and character of Australian spirits is so unique. But it takes distilling prowess and another critical ingredient to bring these products to market. And that ingredient is Bintani. Bintani supplies distillers with malts of all colours, flavours and aromas. They have a leading range of yeast and other ingredients and the professional expertise to help distillers create the spirits of their dreams. Make Bintani your partner in taste and quality. If I look back and I think about people making IPAs, I think back in the day they were in, we're talking like late 90s, they were generally English IPAs. The, the hops that were available back then were more English. We certainly had a hand-pumped English IPA on tap in the Wigan Pan Brew Pub. And I think, realistically, we didn't have a lot of opportunity to get a lot of American-style hops. And I think, naturally, people brewed with ingredients that they could get hold of, and, and obviously English hops were around, so English IPAs were around. I think there was quite a few breweries. As more breweries opened up, certainly in the late 90s and the early years, more breweries were making English-style IPAs. I think in terms of starting to make um, US IPA or US-style IPAs, Certainly around the early days, we started to see, you know, a, a much wider range of American hops coming into Australia. So this would be around like 2000-ish, sort of? I can't remember what year Little Creatures started, but they obviously led, you know, led the charge of using American hops, although there were some around. I mean, we, we were definitely using American hops in the late 90s, but they weren't really that good, and they weren't really delivering those punchy, fruity flavours that you want to get out of an American IPA. So I think once the hops started to change in, in, in the O's, then people started to brew those American-style IPAs and try and emulate some of the classic ones, you know, like Russian River out of the US and, and, and try and start brewing those, you know, those, those type of IPAs. Feral Hop Hog probably would have been one of the ones that I think of that 
people might know that dates back to around that time? Yeah, absolutely. Feral Hop Hog was definitely one of the first ones, certainly to be nationally distributed. Alpha Pale Ale, um, it, whilst not an IPA, it was certainly an American style interpretation of a pale ale, and so that was certainly around then as well. And at Benspoke, obviously, you've got a range of IPAs and you'd be one of the few breweries in the country, I would think, where an IPA is actually your flagship beer. Yeah, fair point. Yeah, I mean, we set out when we opened the brew pub, we had five different beers and a cider on tap and we were really surprised that our IPA ended up being our biggest selling beer. So that just shows what people wanted and where the consumer had got to in 2014 when we opened up. Obviously, I'm a big fan of those really hoppy beers and we have a range of IPAs and I think Crankshaft is obviously, while still, you know, I think a good IPA, it's obviously on the approachable level of IPAs, not the higher end of the style spectrum, I suppose. So I think as the consumer's demands have evolved over the last sort of, I guess, six years, it's obviously been in trend with what's going on around the world and that wanting hoppier styles of beer. Your IPAs, I think, are a little bit different to some of the other ones that are on the market in that there's probably a little bit more malt character in them, yet the body is still quite light at the same time. Tell me about what you think is sort of your ethos on how to make a good IPA. My ethos is really, and this was something that came from Vinny at Russian River, and he always said, you can chuck as many hops as you want in a beer, but you still need to have that real good multi backbone to start with to be able to layer those hops in. So I've always made IPAs by getting a good malt base going. And you can still have different malt bases. Crankshaft definitely uses a little bit of Caramunic malt, which is a slightly caramelised malt, to give us a little bit more malty sweetness to be able to then balance that with bitterness and, and different hop flavours and, and aromas. On the other side of it, you know, like a sprocket has still got a nice sort of Munich style sort of malt character, um, but it's still quite dry as well. So I think it's really important to have a really good malty backbone so you can layer the hops in. And we add hops at four different stages through our IPAs. And I think that starting with a good malt backbone is the key to be able to layer those hops in. What about yeast? I think you've mentioned to me before that you think yeast is a little bit overlooked as well in making these beers. Absolutely. Um, I think yeast is critical, choosing a yeast that does its job consistently without dominating the beer flavours is important. A lot of IPAs come across as being really fruity, but we're talking about fruity esters from the yeast rather than fruity characters that have come from the oils in the hops. Um, and I think once you start getting fruity esters from the yeast, they dominate over the top of those um, fruity characters from the hop. So it's really important to have a clean, clean yeast. I think because obviously dry hopping is a big part of IPA, it's very hard unless you have a, you know, a pretty good setup in terms of yeast handling to be able to reuse yeast that's had been in contact with dry hops. One of our addition stages is we're adding hops at the same time we add the yeast to the fermenter. Um, so obviously very hard to then reuse that yeast. So we're using fresh yeast each time we make a beer. That's really important for me in terms of showcasing the hops. And if you were to try and reuse the yeast, what would be the concern there that you'd just have too much other vegetable matter in there with it to sort of repitch? The weakest point in beer in terms of, you know, getting any sort of um, bacteria involved is probably the wort at the start of fermentation and making sure you get a good ferment going. Now, if, if you're dry hopping a beer and you want to collect that yeast, you need to wash that yeast. Um, you then need to let that yeast settle to be able to then work out how much you actually need to repitch. And there's quite a few stages there to get that perfect. It can be done, but it's a big risk because if that ferment doesn't take off, then the beer's not going to end up, you know, any good. And you've got to, you know, got to dump that beer and start again. And I guess whether you're running a production brewery or a brew pub, you don't have time and room for putting beer down the drain. No one wants to do that. So I think once you actually have to make beer consistently and deliver something to the consumer that they know they're going to get every time that they buy your beer, you've got to simplify things. Um, you can't be too complicated, have too many variables. And yeast handling is, um, you know, obviously the bigger and bigger breweries and the um, certainly the big breweries, but also the bigger craft breweries certainly uh, look at reusing yeast because, you know, obviously a massive cost saving there. Is it massive though? How much expense is, in, is tied up in yeast versus like something like hops, which we know are really, really expensive? Yeah, I think when you look at it, you know, you're talking about, you know, a few kilos of, you know, a few kilos of hops will, will pay for your yeast. So it's really not, to me, it's not that much in terms of 
delivering a consistent, um, good quality beer to use fresh yeast each time. You mentioned about you add hops at four stages of the process. How long have you been doing that for? Like, has that been an evolution of like a, you know, something that you have just a lot of experimentation over many years of working out what gets the best results? Obviously we do the traditional hopping stages. We do that in the kettle and we do that in the whirlpool. I think it's important to note there that we use different hops in the kettle and in the whirlpool. Certain hops work better in the whirlpool than the kettle and certain hops work better in the kettle than the whirlpool. Once we leave the hot side and we go into the cold side, we start to talk about dry hopping and some beers get dry hopped potentially three times. So we're using hops at five different stages. But one of the stages that I've always done, it certainly in the last sort of 12 years, has been dry hopping when we actually pitch the yeast. And what I'm finding there is that the word actually um, breaks down the, the hop oils before fermentation and stores those as compounds that don't get blown off during fermentation. And so you can actually get some flavours stored before that fermentation kicks off or becomes very vigorous. And that's something that I think does contribute a layer of flavour to the beer and certainly our beers in terms of their hop character. Now, looking at your range, obviously Crankshaft is your flagship IPA. Sprocket seems to be pretty much a permanent fixture these days. And then you've got Cluster 8. Tell me about the differences between those beers because you obviously want to try and have beers that have a reason for existing. They're very distinctive from one another. Yeah, look, I mean, I think the, the plan there was to always have drinkability with... I wanted an IPA that I could smash a few pints and really enjoy those hop characters. So I didn't want it at 7%. Um, I wanted it, you know, a bit lower. So because it is a bit lower in alcohol, 5.8%, I wanted to add a bit more malt to it because it's obviously we're not starting with as much malt as if we were making a 7% IPA. So we put a bit of the Caramunic malt I was talking about earlier in there to add a little bit more body, then we can layer those hops in over the top. So for me, Crankshaft, it is certainly a more maltier IPA, but having said that, it's still hoppy enough to be in the IPA category. So that's the sessionable one. The Crankshaft's more about showcasing the citrus characters from the hops, whereas the Sprocket's more about the tropical characters. So we actually use the, the Galaxy hop, which is now obviously a big, big hop grown in Australia that a lot of breweries are using. So Sprocket was all about that tropical character. Now, with that tropical character, we wanted a sort of a cleaner malt build, still have a bit of malt there, but not as much maybe as Crankshaft. So um, that was to try and really promote those delicate tropical flavours. I find the citrus flavours can be quite sort of not delicate but more rough. Whilst I, I love them, they seem to pop out a bit better, whereas with the tropical ones, if you have too much malt there, you, they get confused with the, with the malt, the tropical characters, so it's better to have a much drier, less maltier sort of IPA. So that was the idea with Sprocket, and we did obviously put that in that higher end of the IPA bracket. And then obviously Cluster 8's, it's 8%, it's a double IPA, so that's about really showcasing you know, a whole range of hops, both citrus and tropical and adding them at the right times through the process to, achieve, to, to really um, bring out those flavours. So that's a beer that we actually dry hop three times on zero day, seven day and 14 days. And obviously with the two additions in the hot side, it's a five edition beer. We've always used a lot of lupulin, cryo hop in our beer. So cryo is basically where they take the hop flour and they freeze it they shake out all the little lupulin balls or the oil balls from the bract or the centre part of the hop flour. They then collect all those little balls of oil and put all that back together in a pellet. So you're basically getting pure lupulin or pure oil. You're not getting the vegetal um, character that you get from using, say, a T90 pellet, which is the other way that you can use hops. So we use a lot of this cryo. We use a bit of cryo in crankshaft and sprocket as well as Cluster 8, but the, the, the difference is in Cluster 8 is that we use a hell of a lot of cryo. And if we had to use the same amount of T90, we would end up obviously having a massive amount of wastage, but also the vegetal character would take over. So that's the beauty of using cryo. Yeah, I was going to get to the, the sort of vegetal character because there are a lot of IPAs out there that do kind of have hop character that I find can be quite unpleasant and it can be much more in that onion, garlic, sulphur arena, or what people might call that dankness. And, you know, that can be, in lower doses, it can kind of be something that adds complexity, but when it really overtakes the beer, it kind of can be, you know, pretty unpleasant to my tastes. Is that about 
the quality of the hops going into the beer or about hop utilisation or a combination of you know both those things. Those flavours you described are certainly to do with specific varieties of hops. So the parentage of those hops have, contribute that onion and garlicky character. Uh, most notably, hops like Simcoe are big in that. And like you said, I think it's about balance. I mean, we use Simcoe in um, Cluster 8 and we use it in Crankshaft. And it's about making sure that you keep it the level of that onion, garlic, sulfury compounds to a level, like you said, that promotes the other hop characters or the, or the other hops you're using, not overtakes them. And I think that's the key to making good hoppy beers is knowing your hops. There's a lot of information out there that you can look up and you can work out the, the different oils that you're going to get out of different blends of hops and you try and blend different hops together that give you a, a nice combination of different oils so that you, when you use them in the beer, they're going to express the flavours you want. You don't want to just grab three different hops that all have very similar oil profiles because you're really going to have an overload on those particular characters. And if you're using, say, Columbus, it's another hop that is heavy in that onion and garlic. And so if you're using Columbus and Simcoe in a beer, that's a beer you're going to have heaps of onion and garlic and it's going to be really, you know, super dank and probably not have a lot of appeal in that aroma. So it is about selection of varieties and also utilisation. Certainly if you're using more of those on the hot side, you do get less of those sulphur compounds because they do get dissolved and boiled away. Um, but certainly on the cold side, if you're using those hop varieties, you're going to end up with those sulphury characters. So to answer your question, you're right, it's about selecting the right hops, but also knowing where to use them. Is it also about the actual quality of the hops that you're using? You are one of you know quite a few brewers I know that actually does try and go to the US every year to do hop selection. How does the quality of the hop that you manage to get when you go there to do selection, how would that differ to if you just were buying what was available back in Australia? Well, I think back in the day it would have made a much bigger difference than it does today. Back in the day we were just relying on hops coming in and when I questioned the quality of some of the hops, I was told that they were actually the the latest uh, hop year or the latest crop and I said no that can't be right. Luckily for me that supplier had left the sticker on the packet of where they came from so I, I rang up the, it was actually called US Hop Union um, in the US which doesn't exist anymore and let them know hey can you let me know what how old this batch of hops is and when I heard it was seven years old or eight years old. Seriously? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I thought okay we've got to change this. For me getting better quality hops and getting more into being able to choose the hops I wanted started really a little bit by accident because I got sent a pamphlet from our friends at Bintani who obviously ingredient supplies to all the breweries in Australia and on that pamphlet it had a Yakima Chief um, logo on it and as soon as I got that brewing pamphlet back in the early 2000s I called up Pete and said hey Pete can you get some hops now I see there's a logo on your pamphlet so sure enough he um, actually um, called them up and we got some hops air freighted over and they were just fantastic. The, the difference between getting good quality fresh hops, it just translates straight through into the beer. Whilst I know the Belgian brewers and certainly when you're making some of the sour beer styles you want to use hops that are quite old and don't have a lot of character, making good IPA is all about having really good quality hops and I think you know, getting access to those sort of led me to wanting to go over to the hop harvest um, and then finding out that you can actually go and select your own hops and you can, you might get three batches of citra put in front of you, you can rub and smell and choose which one you actually want to buy, you know, sort of in heaven there for a while. And um, so I now do that every year, go over and select. We're obviously buying a few tonnes of hops these days, so it's um, important to go over and really get to know the farmers and get to know how the hops are looking. What are the changes too from the previous season? Hops are, you know, a naturally grown product, so you want to know what, what the changes are. And when you get those three different batches of citra, how pronounced would the differences be? And tell me also about the sort of the rubs and the, you know, do you make like a tea or something like that? How do you actually put them to the test when you're there? Yeah, basically what you're getting is you're just getting straight flowers. I mean, it's quite hard actually, it's quite challenging. Three, you know, batches of citra. One could be really different and the other two could be really the same. The idea is you get those flowers and you rub them between your hands until you generate a little bit of heat and that promotes the, the hop oils that are in those hops. And you, you know, obviously take a good sniff and really then dissect what you're actually smelling and are you getting citrus? Are you getting, you know, candy-like characters? What are you actually getting out of that? particular batch of citra and then you might end up you know even blending a little bit of one and a little bit of another and rubbing that blend together and seeing if those 
two hops together actually make a better flavour balance than one by themselves. And if you're not sure, then you've obviously got, they've got great people in the hop industry in the US and they're really knowledgeable at doing this. So they'll give you feedback as well on what you're getting. And then you can see who grew that hop, the oil content or the oil makeup of that hop. And maybe if you're a bit surprised by the oil makeup in terms of maybe there's too much onion and garlic in it, you might go, all right, I might have to do that again and, and look at a different one that has potentially has less onion and garlic on paper, but maybe it's a little bit more pronounced in real smelling time. So if you're choosing, you know, eight or nine different hop varieties, um, it can be quite a long process. This episode of Drinks Adventures is supported by Fever Tree Premium Mixers, the mixer of choice in the world's best bars and restaurants. Right now, I'm enjoying Fever Tree's smoky ginger ale as the perfect accompaniment to some of my favourite bourbons and whiskies. We were talking about your range of IPAs. Is Sprocket now a permanent part of the range? Yeah, Sprocket's a core product now, so it'll be around, well, it'll be around forever probably. Yeah, it's certainly the sales of Sprocket have increased, so um, that's certainly one of the beers that we've um, had much increased production. It's also the only beer we've got our 360-degree lid on as well because we can't get those lids anymore and New South Wales EPA has deemed them to be illegal in New South Wales from May next year. So we've got enough lids left to do one beer or a certain amount of volume and that volume sort of worked out perfectly for Sprocket. And it's the type of beer that really needs that lid because you can see the beer, you can smell the beer and you can taste the beer better with a 360 degree lid in, in my opinion. Now, one of the biggest trends that we've seen in IPAs over the last few years is obviously this whole juicy, hazy milkshake being the most extreme example of that sort of style. I haven't really noticed Spence Boke, you know, putting out too many beers along those lines. What's your feeling about that genre of beers? I guess we've always done hazy beers. I mean, we haven't, we don't filter our beer, we don't find our beer, we do centrifuge it, but... You know, all our beers have a certain amount of haze to them. I think that that's, you know, there's a lot of flavour in the haze. So if you're taking the haze out, the beer does, um, doesn't does pop as much as if there's a bit of haze in there. Certainly we've seen those, the hazy IPAs and really people getting that deep cloudiness. Look, there's some really good ones and, and there's, there's some really bad ones. And I think the important thing to note is there's a difference between yeast haze and hop haze. So beers that have yeast haze in them, for me, that's not the idea of making a hazy IPA. Hazy IPA is all about that hop haze and dry hopping um, with, the, with a certain you know, high quantity that delivers that deep hop haze. Why hasn't Ben spoke done one? We've certainly done a couple in the brew pub. I think, as I said, I think all our beers are a bit hazy anyway. You don't feel a need to pander to that consumer that is really looking for that intensely hazy beer and also a beer that's kind of marketed. You know, you haven't got a beer that's got haze or juice in the name or anything like that. I think for me, juicy's a bit different. Like juicy yeah. beers are about that real sort of fruit juice character and you can get clear beers that, or clearish beers that are juicy. Um, but the hazy beers, um, it's actually quite hard to make a hazy beer, package it and have it hazy the whole time. A lot of people do do hazy IPAs and if they've been sitting in your fridge for you know a few days, then you go and pour it out, and if you don't shake it up, move it around a bit, the beer comes out pretty clear. And we're working on it. We've been working on a few recipes in the brew pub about a hazy IPA, and we'll look, we'll do one at some point, I think, for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, we make beer for two reasons. We, we make beer that we want to drink, absolutely, but we also got to understand that we need to make beer that the consumer wants to drink. So, if the consumer is demanding that we do a hazy IPA, then it makes sense that we will do a hazy IPA, but it is quite tricky. And look, I don't know, James, do you know some really good hazy IPAs that are available nationally around Australia? Not so much available nationally, no. Exactly. So it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to do and it takes a bit of time and a bit of, bit of research to try and get it right. So we've been working on it. I, I don't know how close we are. I wouldn't say we're too far away, but we're certainly not maybe thinking that we're going to get one out next week. We were talking about Cluster 8 before. That's got quite a different malt profile as well to the other beers, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's probably a slightly higher malt character than the Sprocket, but then laid in over the top of that is obviously all those hop characters. It is a similar malt character to Crankshaft. We use a bit more darker Caramunic than the lighter one. I want our double IPA to have a bit of colour to it. There's a lot of double IPAs out there that are really light in colour, and I just thought we'd do one that had a bit dark green colour and provide a little bit more multi-backbone that we can actually add a lot more bitterness as well because 
The beer's obviously being a lot higher in alcohol, it's going to finish a lot higher in terms of residual sugar and so we want to be able to add a lot more bittering hops to add that bitterness to balance that malt sweetness. You've already mentioned Russian River and Vinny Chaluzzo and I've read him talking about how he thinks that to make a good double IPA you need to use corn syrup in order to make sure that you have a bit of a thinner body than you would otherwise have. Is that something that's still common practice? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll be honest, we use some dextrose in our sprocket and we use it in our cluster 8 as well. Whilst I do want to still have a bit of malt character, I don't want it to be too flabby or too fat as, as some people call it. I still want to have a bit of malt character. You can have malt character and still have a beer dry. And the difference between not having it malty and dry is sort of malty and sweet. And the way to stop it from being sweet is to use something that's 100% fermentable and it will ferment right out and provide that dryness. So whilst we use some coloured malts, caramunic malts in the cluster eight, we do use some dextrose in cluster eight as well and that makes sure that the beer does ferment down low enough so you do have a nice multi-dry finish. We haven't talked about the fourth ingredient yet. In the case of those beers, it'd be the fifth ingredient, but um, we haven't talked about water. And when I had DJ McCready from Mountain Culture on late last year, we talked quite a lot about the way that he's really experimenting with manipulating water in his brewery. Do you have the ability to do that here? Yeah, we do. Look, Canberra water's pretty good. So it's really soft. And so we add a lot of minerals back into the water each brew. And we're basically adding chloride into the beer or adding um, sulphate to really change the, the, certainly the sulphate levels are important when you're making hoppy beers because that does promote hop flavour and hop aroma. So it's important to tweak that. So certainly with our pale ale barley griffin, we use a blend of chloride and sulphate, more chloride than sulphate. And then once we get into the IPAs, we're using a similar rate of chloride and sulphate. And then as we step up from crankshaft to sprocket to cluster eight, we're just using different quantities of that same 50-50 blend. So cluster eight would have twice as much salts added to it than crankshaft does. One of the other things that you hear all the time and a lot of breweries have even got it on their can is drink fresh. I have found that that is not always, you know, drinking a beer as close as possible to when it's been packaged is not always what it's cracked up to be. And quite often I've been surprised to find that a beer that I found quite finished quite harsh. If I then discover it back at the fridge a month later, it might have softened out and it might, you know, the drinkability might have been improved. What do you think is at play there? Are those beers that should possibly have maybe been released a little bit too early? Yes, potentially. That's what, what we're, we're talking about. I think making sure your beer is properly conditioned before you package it certainly goes a long way to having less change. I always do believe in drinking beers fresh, provided they have been conditioned properly. Um, I think that's the difference. If you condition your beer properly, then you package it, you definitely want to be drinking it fresh because you're going to pick up a bit of oxygen in the packaging process and that oxygen will just obviously oxidise those hop compounds and you'll lose flavour and, and lose aroma. If you package your beer, you know, without the conditioning time, then you're relying on the, a bit of conditioning in the package. Now, that can, that can be good and bad because you're obviously going to the beer, as you say, James, will get a little bit better because you're conditioning it in the can or in the bottle, but it'll also start to oxidise as well. So it's a, it'll be a fine line to get that beer tasting at its best. It wouldn't be necessarily an exact science to get that beer tasting at its best. You'd sort of have to play around a little bit there with a bit of tasting to work out when the best time to drink that beer is. Oh, I've done plenty of experimentation. <laughs> but what about with the level of dry hopping that's happening now? The enemy there is also that sort of astringency. Do you think in, the, in those newer sort of styles of really, really heavily dry hopped beers that they do sometimes need Need a little bit of time to settle down. You know, it, it's a bit like a pasta sauce. It needs time to come together and all that. I feel like there's kind of two messages that people are being told about IPAs from different brewers. And it's kind of confusing for the consumer because, of course, historically IPA, the origin of IPA was not about drinking fresh at all. So it's quite a complicated thing for people to understand. Yeah, it is. And I think it comes back to the last conversation that's about conditioning and when you condition it. We generally do cold condition our double IPA for a couple of weeks, whereas with crankshaft and sprocket, they could be cold conditioned for four to five days. I think that does make a big difference. Well, the conditioning process does create a, a much better harmony between the different hops that you're using, but also, you know, integrating it with the malt. I personally don't think that 
the beer does get better in the can. We can our beers. I can't speak for the people who bottle. When I taste the beer out of the bright tank and then I taste the beer out of the can on the same day of packaging, I still think the beer tastes better out of the bright tank. I think maybe the second day past canning, it, maybe it has settled a little bit, maybe it's a little bit better than the first day, but then from there on, it, it's never as good as drinking it out of the bright tank. Once you get the beer processed and it's ready to package, that's the best time to drink the beer, especially if it's been condition run. I think all styles have different conditioning requirements. And that might maybe be in the case of those breweries that I'm mentioning that maybe they don't have the tank capacity to be leaving beers conditioning for that long. So they're kind of releasing them almost out of necessity a little bit green. You're probably right. Back in the day when we were talking about bottle conditioning beers and people would release beers into the market hoping that they'd be carbonated properly, but a lot of the time the beers wouldn't have conditioned or the, the natural carbonation wouldn't have been formed in the bottle. So there are a lot of flat bottles of beer out there in the market. I think people have got a lot better at that and actually now are releasing beers once they can prove that they are properly carbonated and ready for the consumer. Well, mate, it's been a really interesting chat, so we might leave it there. Thanks for joining me on the Drinks Adventures podcast. Yeah, thanks, James, and it's great to see people like yourself doing these types of things. Um, this is the beautiful thing about um, talking about something that we all love is that, you know, a lot of people do want to hear about this stuff, and without people like yourself doing this, we wouldn't be able to tell our story. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Cheers. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people that this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.